So in this video, we're going to talk about inverse Compton scattering. So Compton scattering is a general picture for an electron scattering a photon. And so on the left side here, we have a picture of a high energy photon coming in, striking electron and transferring some energy into that electron. So it's moving off and we end up with a uh, losing some energy in the photon as a result. So this is a picture of traditional Compton scattering. And in a previous lecture, we've shown that in order to get any appreciable amount of energy into that electron, the energy of that photon needs to be of order the rest mass energy of the electron. So this is traditional Compton scattering. And the picture here is that a photon loses energy through a collision with an electron. Now inverse Compton is a way of transferring energy from the electron into a photon. So the picture here is we have a lower energy photon that strikes a moving electron. And we end up with an electron that is not moving as quickly, but our photon has gained some energy. So this is the picture of inverse Compton scattering. So you'll recall for the Compton scattering case, we found that the change in wavelength of the outgoing photon versus the incoming photon was given by the Compton wavelength times a factor that took into account the angle with which the exiting photon left relative to the incoming photon, this 1 minus cosine phi term. And this Compton wavelength defined to be h over the mass of the electron times the speed of light. And it is of order two hundredths of an angstrom. And if you express that in terms of energies, you have that the energy of the exiting photon, E1, is equal to the energy of the incoming photon, E0, over 1 plus E0 over the rest energy of the electron, MEC squared, times the term that accounts for the exiting angle. So the idea is that in order to have lost a substantial amount of energy, because any energy that's not in E1 is transferred into the energy of the electron here, E, you need this denominator to be significantly larger than 1, which means that E0 needs to be significantly larger than the mass of the electron times C squared. So that's the origin of this limit, that Compton scattering becomes important when the energy of the incoming photon is of order the rest mass of the electron. Now in the inverse Compton case, we could repeat the derivation that we did for Compton scattering if only our electron weren't moving. But unfortunately our electron is moving, possibly at relativistic speeds. So in order to get into a frame of reference where we can repeat our Compton scattering derivation, we need to move into the reference frame of the electron. So I'm going to write in blue here to indicate that we're in the reference frame of the electron. And in this reference frame, the measured energy of the incoming photon, E0, is equal to the energy of that photon in the laboratory frame, E0, but this time black is in the lab frame, times the Lorentz factor that accounts for the change in the perceived energy moving into the electron's frame, times whatever Doppler shifting is incurred depending on what direction the electron is moving. So we end up with a 1 minus V over C cosine theta 0 term here where this is Doppler shifting. And theta 0 here is the angle between the direction the electron is moving and the direction of the incoming photon. So if the photon is going this way and the electron is going this way, then this angle right here is theta 0. And I'm writing this in black because this is in the laboratory frame. So once we've boosted into the electron's frame here, we can repeat the entire derivation we did for the Compton scattering case. And we end up with, with this answer right here relating the perceived output energy of the photon compared to the perceived input energy of that photon in the electron's reference frame. So I'm switching colors to blue here to indicate that we're still in the electron's reference frame. The energy of the outgoing photon is related to the energy of the incoming photon is E0 over 1 plus the energy of the incoming photon in the electron's reference frame over the rest energy of the electron times this angle dependence where I've written the angle now in blue. So it's a blue phi to indicate that the energy of the outgoing photon depends on the perceived angle between the incoming and outgoing photons in the reference frame of the electron. So this angle depends on your reference frame and we're in the electron's reference frame. Finally, once we've computed the energy of the outgoing photon in the reference frame of the electron, we can boost back into the laboratory frame. So in the laboratory frame, the energy of the outgoing photon, E1, 
is similarly related by a gamma factor, or a Lorentz factor, to the energy of the outgoing photon in the electron's reference frame, and then we need to Doppler shift that photon again as we go back into this different re reference frame. So we end up with a 1 plus V over C cosine of theta 1. So what was this theta 1 factor here? Well, if you remember as we underwent our initial boost into the electron's reference frame, we had theta 0, which was the angle between the incoming photon and the reference frame of the electron. So in the laboratory frame, as we're about to jump into the electron's reference frame, what is the angle between the direction the electron is moving and the direction the photon is moving? Now as we jump back into the laboratory frame, we have a new angle, which is the angle between the direction the, the laboratory frame is appearing to move compared to the direction of the outgoing photon. So this is the outgoing photon here, photon 1, as opposed to photon 0 up here. And this is the laboratory frame. And we're now measuring in the reference frame that we had boosted to, what is the angle theta 1 between the outgoing photon and the laboratory frame. And just one subtle point here, we jumped into the inertial frame of the electron prior to the scattering. Once the scattering happens, that electron may actually be moving a little bit, in the reference frame that we jumped into. This is because the, un the electron underwent an acceleration. So by boosting into the inertial reference frame of the electron before the scattering doesn't ensure that we're in, that the electron is at rest in our reference frame after the scattering. So the electron may be moving a little bit according to kind of your standard Compton scattering here. And so when we jump back into the laboratory reference frame, we're jumping back from the inertial reference frame of the initial electron. So we're measuring the angle between that electron's reference frame and the outgoing photon. And of course the last little issue here is that we have a plus sign here to indicate that our velocity has changed directions as we're jumping back into the laboratory's frame, which is moving in the opposite direction of the direction the electron was moving initially. So we could go ahead and plug in all these values to get an expression for E1 in the laboratory reference frame in terms of factors that only depend on the laboratory's reference frame with the exception of this one little angle here. But the algebra gets pretty dirty. So instead we'll just take some limits here. So limit one is, is that if in the electron's reference frame the energy of the incoming photon is much smaller than the rest energy of the electron, which is essentially taking us out of the, in the reference frame of the electron, the Compton scattering regime where a significant amount of energy can get put into the electron. So if in the electron's reference frame, we're not in a regime where a lot of energy can get transferred into the electron, then in the laboratory frame, the energy of the outgoing photon is approximately gamma squared times the energy of the incoming photon times the two Doppler shifts that we see, which was the, the Doppler shift going to the reference frame of the electron times the Doppler shift coming back. We're only left with one angle here that depends on the reference frame of the electron. But that's okay, we weren't really solving for these angles anyway, and if we take kind of typical collisions where theta zero and theta one are of order pi over two, so that these two Doppler terms are on average just unity, they average out to unity, then E1 is of order gamma squared times E zero. Now this is interesting because gamma is a factor that's greater than one and gets larger and larger the more relativistic this electron was. So even though there wasn't a lot of energy in the photon, just the fact that we had a relativistic electron means that E1, the energy of the outgoing photon, can potentially have more energy than the incoming photon. Some of the energy gets robbed from the electron and gets transferred into the outgoing photon. And the second limit here is if in the reference frame of the electron, the incoming photon does have an energy that's much greater than the rest energy of the electron, then we end up that in the reference frame of the electron, E1 is approximately equal to E0. We get that E0 dominates the denominator over here, so that our E0s end up canceling out, and E1 ends up being of order MEC squared. And so if in the reference frame of the electron, the outgoing photon has energy MEC squared, then in the laboratory frame, E1 is of order gamma MEC squared. So in the low energy photon regime, for a relativistic electron, we get that the energy transferred into the outgoing photon depends as gamma squared times the energy of the incoming photon, 
but for high energy photons, the energy of the outgoing photon is maximized at around gamma times MeC squared. So now let's think about a situation where we've got a bath of photons here. So we have some low energy photons traveling every which way. In the middle of it, we have a electron that's moving relativistically. And the question is, how much energy does this electron impart on this photon bath? Or said a different way, how much are these photons upscattered by this relativistic electron? Well, to order of magnitude, we could say that the power scattered by this relativistic electron, where gamma is much bigger than one, well, it should depend on the cross-section for scattering, which we'll take to be the Thomson cross-section, times the velocity that these electrons are moving at, which for gamma way bigger than one is for all intents and purposes C. And then we need to take into account how many photons it hits, which would be the number density of photons, which I'll write as NPH here, times the energy that is transferred into the photon bath for every collision with a photon. So the total power radiated it's going to be of order the product of the cross-section times the velocity times the number density of the photons times the energy transferred per collision. And just to check our units, this has units of area times length per second. So we end up with a volume per second that's swept out by this electron. We take the product with the number density of photons. That gives us the number of photons per second that are collided with and the the change in energy for each collision, the delta E, gives us energy per time, which is power. Now the problem is the energy transferred per collision depends on the energy of the photon that we hit, according to this equation right up here. So we actually need to take into account how many photons are at each energy and integrate over all of the different energy transfers that happen for each kind of electron. So this ends up being of order Thomson cross-section times C times the integral of the number density of photons times the occupation, the fraction that are at each energy E times the energy exchange at that energy. And if gamma is much larger than one, then delta E is essentially gamma squared E zero, meaning that we don't need to just subtract off the initial energy of the photon because it's negligible compared to the energy that it ends up with. And then we're integrating that over energy. So what we end up integrating here is for each energy the photon could be at, we're adding up the energy of, that, of those photons over all the energy. So this here, other than the gamma factor, is adding up the energy density of the photon field. This ends up being sigma t times the speed of light times a gamma squared factor, pulling that out, times the energy density of the photon field. So it's the integral of all the energies of the photon. So this is an order of magnitude derivation that gives us a sense of how much energy an electron gave to the photon bath per unit time. But we can do a little bit better. We just need to be a little more careful about how much energy was actually given to the photons by the electron as opposed to the energy that they began with. We made the assumption that the initial energy of the photons was negligible because the electron was relativistic. So it held for gamma being very large. So to fix that, all we need to do is change our, our gamma squared here into a gamma squared minus one where we subtract off the initial energy E zero of the photon. And it just follows from the definition of gamma the gamma squared is one over one minus b squared over c squared. So gamma squared minus one is equal to b squared over c squared times one minus b squared over c squared. So if we define beta to be v over c, it's the velocity in units of speed of light, then gamma squared minus one is actually just gamma squared beta squared. So we can substitute gamma squared beta squared here. If it turns out if you do this just a little more carefully, you also pick up a factor of four thirds. So we end up with an exact expression, which is that the net power transferred into the photon bath by a relativistic electron is equal to four thirds times the Thomson cross section times the energy density of the photon bath times C times beta squared times gamma squared. So for inverse Compton scattering, this is a, an expression for the power transferred into the photon bath. And if we use this exact expression to clean up 
our initial approximation, we can say that the average energy of an outgoing photon that's Compton upscattered is equal to 4 thirds gamma squared, beta squared, just fixing this with a, a factor of 4 thirds, times the average initial energy of that photon. So those are the basics of inverse Compton scattering.